your focus initially as it relates to nutrition and, and, and maybe we can tie that into to your work as an author and sure. your experience in the publishing industry and trends that you've seen as it relates to nutrition and the Mediterranean diet? Well, it all happened around the same time and it was totally unplanned and something I never thought I would be doing in my life. But mm -hmm. when I was 15, my mom was diagnosed with diabetes. Uh -huh. And so I was the family cook. So I was the one who had to make our meals. And then now I had to make them fit into her lifestyle plan. And I also had to make them taste good because if I didn't, nobody would eat it. So it was, it was kind of like what a lot of, of adults and parents deal with nowadays, I was dealing with as a kid. This mm -hmm. was before the internet and it was before the American Diabetes Association had a lot of great books to offer. So yeah. it was hard. And um, you know, I would I would look at it from two sides. I would say, what could I do that would taste the best, and then what can I do that would be the most healthy or that, that would fit into her lifestyle plan. So mm -hmm. I really just researched and did as much as possible, and to learn about nutrition, to learn about what the guidelines were. And that was a big thing in the beginning. I was really concerned about the guidelines. Yes. She actually came home from the doctor with a prescription pad of all the things that she couldn't write. The, the, sorry, that she couldn't eat. Yes. And I said, oh no, we looked at it and we kind of mourned for like three days because we were like, what are we going to eat? <laughs> right. But then after a while I said, you know, let's switch it. What can we eat? So I started making lists of what we could eat mm -hmm. and then I started making meals from that. And then as, when I started doing it professionally, I thought, okay, what can we eat? But then what's going to give you more bang for your buck? Where's the culinary medicine? What spices can we use to, to help this? What herbs are really good for people with diabetes? Mm -hmm. And then when I started publishing with the American Diabetes Association and working with the U.S. Endocrine Society, that became much more of my focus because I wanted mm -hmm. to really speak to that part of food can be a medicinal uh, property and so we talk about that a lot of times and that that's yeah. that's pretty much where my focus is going nowadays great good uh, well you know I think I think we should dig into the presentation Michelle. sure um, we're gonna take a look at some slides again this will be available to you if you'd like to download uh, any uh, or download this deck because I think it's pretty rich and actually it was really informative and helped you. me understand your work uh, a lot better. So Mick, let's switch to the um, slides layout and we can uh, dig right into it. Perfect. There this you go. This is Amy. great. So I call this with pleasure and health. Okay. And I learned this saying in Egypt, instead of saying bon appetit, when someone goes to eat, they say bilhana mashefa, which means with pleasure and health. And I thought, uh -huh. you know, what a beautiful, what a beautiful comment. That's, that should be, so it's, it's become, this is the way I find my books. That's my motto in life. Uh -huh. And um, so here's some social media information if anybody's interested. I should mention, though, I'll, we'll have all the links at the end so you can click. Cool. Um, so what I thought we could do is kind of define the Mediterranean diet, Perfect. talk about you know how the diet or the lifestyle can be used to optimize health. We'll go over a little bit of history and culture, mm -hmm. kind of some nutritional facts, mm -hmm. and then if anybody's interested in maybe practical tips of giving to patients or to you know for people in their family or, or college students, they can they can use these. Sure. Um, they're, they're applicable to all. Okay. Um, so first, I start out by defining the Mediterranean diet. Um, and it can, it's defined as many different things depending upon who you ask and in which country. A lot of different cultures have different types of models and charts that they use, but I'm going to go with the American one. This one was put together by Old Ways, and this is the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid. Mm -hmm. So in 1958, um, Ansel Keys went to Southern Italy and began s documenting the people there and how they were having much lower incidence of heart disease and mm -hmm. things like that, living longer. Mm -hmm. And this started a whole trend of American researchers to go to Greece, to Spain, to Italy, and really look at what was going on there mm -hmm. and what people were doing and bring it back. Um, so this is when the, the trend started, when the phenomenon started. Obviously people were eating this way for millennia, yeah. but it became defined in our psyche back then. And so this is the, the pyramid that they, originally the one they put together was in 1993. Mm -hmm. So it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. All and right. this is the new one. Um, and you can see on the base of the pyramid, it's be physically active and enjoy meals with others. Mm -hmm. So um, this to me is really why it's more of a lifestyle and not a diet, because yeah. this is at the key. Mm -hmm. And they find mm -hmm. that before you even talk about food, you should talk about this. So Epicurus said way, way you know, in antiquity, that before you find something to eat, find someone to eat with, so to decide who you're going to eat with first. Mm -hmm. And it's, it still holds true. Mm -hmm. um, eating alone in the Mediterranean is just not something that's, that's done often, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And also being physically active. You know, obviously the more active you are, the more food you can enjoy. So mm -hmm. it's a great thing. And, and the Mediterranean is a food loving place. Whichever culture you're talking about, whichever religion you are, no matter which country you're in, North, you know, Southern Europe or North Africa or the Eastern Levant, everybody loves food. Food is a great topic. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you want to be talking about things that can be included. So this pyramid was put together by Old Ways, uh, the Harvard School of Public Health and the European Office of the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all came together and decided that these were the common elements that everybody has. The next one is plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. So um, all of your, your cereals and your grains, your nuts, uh, legumes, Legumes, beans, uh, vegetables, fruits, things like that, olives, they're all in that category. Then the one up is fish and seafood. 
uh, which they recommend having two to three times a week. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of research with fish and seafood will go on. Mm -hmm. um, then poultry, eggs, and cheese. And then the meats and sweets at the very end because they're the things you're supposed to eat the least of. So okay. what's on the bottom you do most and then all the way going up to what's at the top you do the least. And mm -hmm. my book, uh, The Ultimate Med Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, is actually organized this way, like the pyramids. So there's a chapter on, on plant-based food, there's a chapter on fish and seafood, because I wanted for people at home who weren't familiar with the lifestyle to be able to kind of easily access what it's about and have a lot of um, different choices instead of kind of telling this is the first course, this is the second course. I want to make sure they're getting the right food. Mm -hmm. And I think the greatest thing about the Mediterranean um, diet or lifestyle, depending on how you want to call it, is that it's a lot of what you should be eating with a little bit of what you shouldn't. So you don't have to give anything up. There's no, there's no sacrifice, but you can still have, you know, on Sunday or Friday or Saturday, whatever your special day is, you can have that sweet, you can have that, you know, larger mm -hmm. portion, but every day, mostly, you're eating really good, the things that, that are going to give you the most bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. um, so this slide talks about, unfortunately, a, a horrible statistic that I don't like to mention because I don't like people to get familiar with the idea that diet is the number one killer of Americans. Mm -hmm. And it really is the number one killer of adults in the United States. And I, I think that's such a horrendous thing considering what a great country we are and how much great food we have available and how much knowledge we have available and how educated you know, our culture is. So um, that's, that's something that I often start with. This next slide shows the difference between the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid in 1993 when it was first put out mm -hmm. and 2015, which is the one I showed you. Yep. And you can see um, in 1993, there on the bottom there's breads and grains. Yes. They don't talk about the lifestyle component. Okay. They go right into the food. So this addition of lifestyle is new. And then how they divide things up is also a little different, but that's mm -hmm. the big takeaway is like now we're paying much more attention to lifestyle mm -hmm. than in, begin in the beginning. And I can't stress that point enough, not only for uh, the actual efficacy of the diet, who are for people who are at home trying to practice it and trying to do it but also for people who are looking to make a lifestyle change or knowing that they want an improvement you need an emotional buy-in you know in the olden days when this when this diet was being developed mm -hmm. people were following religions that requested them to fast a certain number of days or be vegan a certain number of days uh -huh. or th and all these things were wrapped in in modern times not so many people are doing that mm -hmm. so there has to be an emotional component that makes people think this is worthwhile and the light that's the lifestyle that's mm -hmm. adopting the notion that, that food is to be valued, that, that human friendships and communication and relationships are to be valued mm -hmm. um, before we even begin talking about actual grams of fat and, and things like that. How, uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun, but I, I thought sure. this was an interesting part of the conversation we were having earlier, which is Definitely. What, if you were to give advice uh, when you're giving advice, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you suggest to people, um, how do you make that connection for them? You know, you sure. talked about there's various ways to do this, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can talk about history, you can tie it to their their individual family, uh, you know, backgrounds and culture and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. How do you how mm -hmm. do you make that real? Oh, that's a great question and a right. great point. Um, and I think it's there's there's room enough for all of the nutritionists and the dietitians and doctors and everybody to do the same thing. But what I I do is um, if I'm working with someone spe specific or a specific group of people, mm -hmm. um, I determine what's important to them. You know, is it family time? Is it um, an activity? Is it kind of a sense of accomplishment or completion? It could be a personal mm -hmm. level, it could be a, a group level, right. and then that's where you kind of start with it. So if a lot of people tell me, for example, that they lost the interest of cooking. They just don't like to cook anymore. But cooking is a, is a great pleasure. It's a great way of you know expressing yourself. It's, mm -hmm. It can be a labor of love. It's also a little bit of physical activity. So if you're cooking what you're meeting, that's better. Yeah. So I, I try to kind of talk about those kinds of things. Okay. If it's someone who is looking for a cultural connection that maybe they have lost, mm -hmm. this is the perfect way to do it, no matter what culture you're from. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be Mediterranean, but mm -hmm. um, the, the food can provide that culture. And, 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 the, and the opposite side, those are the same things that are getting us into trouble because um, you know one of the reasons why the the Italians and the Italian Americans eat differently and have a different diet and, and one you know the Italian American one is a little bit more unhealthy mm -hmm. because with any immigrant population when people come in they they tend to hold on to the celebratory recipes mm -hmm. the Sunday recipes the holiday recipes and that's what gets made the day-to-day -day stuff that you might be eating in Italy with you know beans and greens or, yeah. or fish with a little bit of lemon and salad that isn't so appealing so that kind of goes by the wayside right. and those are the ones that we really have to celebrate most of the time we can still have all the holiday dishes but on the holidays not not every day mm -hmm. and um, right. Right. That's that's what makes the difference. So I talk about that a lot, and you know, people like history. If you're if you're going to serve someone something, for example, and you say, you know, this is this is a, a red wine from southern Italy, and it goes well with pasta sauce. Okay, great. But if I tell you this is made from the Galliopo grape, and during the times of Magna Grecia, they used to take it back and feed it to the Olympic champions, um, and it was a very prestigious. That, that adds a little bit of value. It, it kind of perks your better. interest. <laughs> it tastes better, but it also um, hearing about food before yep. you eat it actually helps to digest it more as well, and it helps yeah. you to eat less. 
So in the, the times of Harun al-Rashid in the, the 12th century in, in Baghdad, they used to actually recite poetry before meals. And it sounds you know, funny now, it's a little bit, we don't need to go quite to that extreme, but it is good for you. It's mm -hmm. not just a luxury, it's, it's actually nutritionally beneficial. Yeah, exactly, I'm so glad I asked. And, I, and that I think is very helpful, hopefully, right? Yes. To, to the practitioners out there, the people who are looking to make some of this the stuff right. Talk know. about food. Smell the food. Feel the food. Right. Um, you know, you might get a strange looks in the grocery store, but it, but at home <laughs> it will have big benefits. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. So how do sure. you get? How how did you get started? Sure. So this yeah. is the story. This is the prescription pad to talk about when my mom came home with that yeah. diagnosis, and that's that's a little picture of the Centro Storico or the historic center of of Crotone, where my family's from, and that's yeah. I consider that to be my start. Um, it would okay. be very hard coming from my family to do any other career than what I ended up doing. It's kind of like destiny set me up perfectly to do this. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because food was a big part of our life, and then it had to be medicine at the same time. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, enter culinary medicine, which is the, the now very trendy topic of the combination of the, mm -hmm. the um, science of nutrition with the culinary arts. And we're talking about it now, but it's something that was happening, you know, in ancient times. In the 1970s, the British examined all of the ancient Egyptian medical texts, and they proved 67% of what they found in those texts to be true. So this, I tell people, mm. this doesn't mean that the other 33% isn't true. It mm -hmm. just means that maybe we haven't gotten there yet. Um, uh -huh. But 67% was true, and this was ancient times. Right. So you know, food has always been used as a way to heal the body. Mm -hmm. And um, whether it's preventative or working with a specific thing, I, it gives people power to know that they can use it that way. Yes. And um, it, it's also you know, just, just a wonderful resource to have for yourself um, to be able to work. Mm -hmm. So this is a saying from uh, from Italy. It says, "Chi mangia da solo si struzza in solitudine," which means if you eat alone, you strangle yourself in solitude. And um, but th but even though it's an Italian quote and an Italian picture, I find this everywhere I go in the Mediterranean. If I'm traveling and I'm eating by myself, or maybe I'm taking a culinary group, but like I need a little bit of just time alone because I've been with people for ten days, yes. and I go in and sit down somewhere, no matter where I am, they will send the owner will come and sit with me, or they will send a waiter, or they will make me sit with a family that's sitting next to them. They will yeah. not let you sit alone. They actually, it's they almost pity people who sit alone. It's like it's it's just as bad as if you didn't eat anything if you're eating a meal by yourself. And well in America we've just gotten beyond that. Like we can it's perfectly socially acceptable to go eating by yourself. <laughs> and, but but it, it is it but there it's really um it's it's kind of like they want to protect you from that. And yeah. so now I'm trying to work, you know, on my blog and things like that. I tell people, you know, how to achieve the Mediterranean lifestyle on American shores. And, I, and eating alone is like the biggest thing because a lot of people eat alone because they live alone or they work alone or, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a writer, I'm developing recipes. So a lot of my quote unquote work day is alone. So, but I'll work, you know, I'll, I'll call a friend who's also a writer or another friend who also has a weird hours and I'll say, okay, let's FaceTime because we're going to eat. In the olden days, you would say, I have to, I'm going to hang up with you because I'm going to eat. Now, I purposely, but, but it's bringing in that energy of mm -hmm. having, you know, the common relationships with people. And, and they found of the, you know, in the different studies of the Mediterranean, one of the things is to have like three confidants in your life, really close confidants that you can, you can call and, and report things to at any time or ask for advice. And yes. so it, to, to have those people around you is really beneficial. And in all of the blue zones, like Icaria and Sardinia, where people are living, you know, into their hundreds and having relatively few health issues, mm -hmm. they're finding that um, they know at a certain time every day that they're going to sit down either with their family or their coworkers or their friends or their community and enjoy a meal. And there's just such a psychological, you know, stress relief, you know, built in process in mm -hmm. that communal meal mm -hmm. that it's really really, really highly recommended. Right, and that's well documented. This is nothing new under the sun. No, no, but we forget about it. We, book, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about broccoli until we're green in the face. We'll talk about kale, we'll talk about it, which I love, but we don't talk about that. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's almost people are worried about offending people. But no, there's, you know, there are modern solutions around it. There, there are apps for people, to, for example, people to exercise together, to carpool. Yes. There could be apps for people to eat together. Mm -hmm. You could knock on your neighbor's door. <laughs> like, the, it takes that initial, initial strand. I know it's weird, but right. it's, it's really worthwhile. Yes. Um, so now going back into the, the nutrient-rich vegetables. Okay. So, you know, um, more of the cruciferous vegetables like the cabbage and the, the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts and things like that really offer a lot of um, benefits for people in terms of warding off cancer and just antioxidant, mm -hmm. zero calorie kind of superfoods. Right. In the Mediterranean diet, we're always building the meal around the vegetable. And I, I stress this a lot, not for the nutritionists and the dietitians, but more for the chefs and for the foodies, because when you're coming into this, if most 
most chefs when they plan a meal in America, they plan it around the protein right. and the, the meat-based food, and then everything is like a, so, you yeah. know around it. But in the Mediterranean, in, in leading into the diet, and historically, people were planning their meals around the vegetables because that's what they had in the garden. Yeah. So like if you if it was eggplant season and you had 40 eggplant, they say in Turkey they say to be a good chef you have to know 40 eggplant recipes, and in southern Italy to be a bride you needed to know 40 you know eggplant recipes because eggplant has a huge bumper crop, yep. and you've got to be able to cook it in a lot of different ways to be able to eat it. Yeah. Uh, also historically they had these festivals called the sagre which um, comes from the word sacred so when in pagan times before christianity they would actually worship the agrarian gods mm -hmm. so whenever there was a harvest they would give thanks to the agrarian god there would be an artichoke festival an eggplant mm -hmm. but you know whatever there was there would, there weren't eggplant in antiquity in italy but it, mm -hmm. but it, whatever there was they would have a festival for it and um they still have them in modern times so a little kid by the time they're nine years old they're going to the piazza they're seeing uh, artichokes or eggplant prepared a million different ways they know already in their mind what you can do with an artichoke what you can do with an eggplant we don't know in in, in america most people don't know what they what they can offer i had um, the other day i had a group of people who i, I offered a spanish antipasto kind of a plate or two and there were some dried figs mm -hmm. and nobody knew what the dried fig was mm. so um and they were very educated people, you know, yeah. but it's, so there's just a disconnect between nature and, and produce and what's available. Mm -hmm. Our bodies crave what's in season. They crave the nutrients of what's in season. Right. What's in season is cheaper. It's readily available. So it's um, that's a good no brainer place for for patients or for, for people who don't know a lot about food to start with. It's just what's in season, what's available mm -hmm. and how many things can you do with it? You know, now we have the Internet. So punch it in Google and see how many, you know, cauliflower recipes you can find and then just mm -hmm. take it from there and, and play around. That's what I, I recommend recommend to people. And that's another way for people to connect, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. asparagus is relatively in season now. Right. Um, in Italy, I was there a few weeks ago, right? Artichokes yes. were happening yes. everywhere. Oh, and they're you know so I mean? amazing. So yeah. I got a steak with artichokes on it. Exactly. Right? I mean, that's just exactly. kind of how it plays out. But what I was getting at is it gives you a chance to go make connections, right? Whether right. it's your community support and agriculture, then you start seeking it out and making it part of, part of your life, right? And exactly. You and it become an activity. It from a couple different sizes, you know. That's a great point. It, out. it can become an activity. You know, right. when I was young, we didn't do the video games and the and the the movies and things like that. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with them. But our entertainment was the food. We mm -hmm. would shuck things together, or we would pick things together, or we would make things. That that was that was all of the entertainment that I remember having. Mm -hmm. And but it was really good because it was family bonding time. It was a yeah. ritual, and it taught me a skill. And so, and I find kids mm -hmm. love it too. The the more that you get them involved, and get adults, hands on it. and yeah. adults love it too, because it's just something that we don't think about doing but once you go to do it you kind of remember and it, everyone will say oh i remember when i was young i used to but we just gotten away so it's a good nice trip down memory lane yeah exactly great so i'll also talk about fruit. fruit speaking of those dried figs ounce yes. per ounce figs have more nutrients than any that. other fruit mm -hmm. um, dates are wonderful too and mm -hmm. when you dry them you compound the nutrients uh -huh. so they're a great portable snack for people who might not think about that or might not know what to eat in the middle of the day at work you know mm -hmm. a handful of nuts some dried fruit and also to learn know that fruit isn't the enemy i have because i deal with a lot of uh, the diabetes community um so pe some people are so scared of fruit people will mm -hmm. tell me offer them a banana and they'll say i can't eat a banana i have diabetes and I'm like, but you just told me you had a uh, something from fast food restaurant that had <laughs> not, isn't appropriate <laughs> for anybody, but they're scared of the banana. So um, fruit's not the enemy. You know, it's being eaten in proportion. Can have a little bit of protein with it. Would be would be really good to help those blood sugar levels mm -hmm. stay even. But but you know, to get the word out that people can have fruit if it's fresh, it's local, it's organic, great. Um, but 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 fruit is needed um, and a great source of energy hmm. for people. And I also like to talk about grains mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, grains get a lot of, of slack, especially with all of everything going on with wheat nowadays yeah. and celiac and things like that. Right. So there are obviously people who have celiac who have to be careful and who, who mm -hmm. have sensitivities and who can't have wheat. There are also different ty types of wheat. Not all wheat is equal, as you know, because you just spent time in Italy. Right. Um, so that's a factor. And then there are other types of grains. So, you know, what, what I find is once people think that they can't have wheat, then they give up grains altogether. They don't explore other um, non, you know, gluten things. Mm -hmm. um, but things like quinoa, things like brown rice or wild rice, yes. um, millet, amaranth, uh -huh. which right. these are all super cheap, yeah. super blank culinary canvases that you can do anything you want with, depending right. upon how you cook them. You can be breakfast, lunch, dinner, buckwheat, muesli, kashi, barley. Mm. It, long before people were eating wheat, in the Mediterranean, they were eating barley. Barley was the original grain. Mm. Barley is readily available. It's inexpensive. Um, it, it's a great substitute where you can make it. We talked about the risotto, I remember. Yes. Um, so I like to make, I, as they do in Italy now, risotto is not just a, a dish, but a technique. 
Yeah. So when you make something in the style of the way that you make risotto, yeah. th they call it, they add the O-T-T-O on the end. So you can make it with farro and have a farrotto. You can make uh -huh. it with barley and right. have an orsotto. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I like to do that also. You could have it as a breakfast cereal, boil it up and toss it into a soup or salad. Mm -hmm. um, but super inexpensive and yeah. really good for you. You get the fiber, mm -hmm. you get the, the carbohydrates, the, the good carbohydrates that you need. Um, and I, I just tend people to, to kind of look at it that way. But a lot of civilizations were built on grains. And so um, it's, it's, it's important to still have them in your diet and not to kind of shun them off completely, unless you're on a, a very low carb diet for a reason that you need to be. But uh, otherwise, you know, they, they are very important to the, um, to the Mediterranean culture. Mm -hmm. so there is a debate out there, depending upon who's speaking of the culture, about you know, whether they're from Greece or whether they're from a different country, um, talking about if the ingredient of the food does not come from the Mediterranean, is it still Mediterranean diet friendly? That's a big topic right now. Really? And everybody okay. has their own opinion. Uh -huh. Me personally, I want people to be healthy. I want mm -hmm. these statistics to change. I don't want diet to be the number one killer of American adults. So if you want to eat quinoa, which is from Latin America, and call it Mediterranean, you don't offend me. Like, it, it's still if it's healthy, it's got olive oil and lemon juice and things like that, I'm happy. And also, you know, when, when does that marker change? Because the new world foods like potatoes and tomatoes and peppers and corn go to any Italian or Spanish or Turkish and tell them that they're not part of their diet. And, you know, they'll think you're crazy. Yeah. But a, you know, a few centuries ago, they, those, are, those were introduced, you know, post-Columbus. Yeah. So they're not that old and they were adapted. So I think avocados, quinoa, things that mm -hmm. aren't necessarily indigenous to those cultures right now can still be eaten and incorporated and, and done in a healthful way. That's that's mm -hmm. the least of our worries in this, this say, discussion. Right? But yeah. it's a big topic. I mean, there you should see the tweets. I'm, um, yeah. I wanted to address that. Um, <laughs> so in why grains are so important is because they were forms of currency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wheat and things like that were worth their weight in gold. The Roman Empire got wheat from North Africa and, mm -hmm. and, and built the whole entire empire Egypt on the wheat. Yes, the same deal. yes. Yeah. And so this was very important to them. And they had refined flour, just yeah. like we do nowadays. Uh -huh. Not not with all the stuff added in it, but, but yeah. made in the same way. And the Romans taxed um, not only the wheat, but also the milling of the wheat very, very heavily. So up until uh, the late 19th century, even in southern Italy, commoners could not afford um, wheat because they couldn't afford the milling of it. Mm. So they would only get what was coming out of the winnower. So even though these these uh, breads and things are so beloved by the culture, they were very hard to come by mm. until more modern times. Nowadays, everybody eats re refined flour. And that's kind of a, a misconception, too, because because we want people to eat whole wheat and we want people to eat whole grains because they're healthier. Yeah. They're saying that that's all that's being eaten in the Mediterranean, but that's not true. Most people are eating a lot of refined f uh, flour on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so it is part of the diet. It is still part of the diet as it was back then. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, just they used to give the breads and the cakes and things as offerings to the gods. That's yeah. how they started out on, uh, you know, for religious ceremonies. So they have a very special place in people's heart. You'll be very hard pressed to get an Italian to give up their their daily bread, literally, yeah. or an Egyptian. You know, and mm -hmm. Italians eat more bread per capita than any people in Europe. I was going to ask how it stacks yes. up against America. Uh, very much, the very States much more. But um, they got voted the healthiest people in Italy last mm -hmm. uh, in Europe last year. Mm -hmm. So that didn't, d uh, you know prevent that from happening in any way. However, the bread's different. There are a lot of artisan bakeries. They're using really good quality ingredients. There are no additives. And they're using um, uh, also mother yeast a lot of times, natural leaveners instead uh -huh. of the chem chemical leavener. So I believe that also plays oh, a role. Yeah, probably a big role. Um, and so th that's one of the ways that you can do it. But you know, when, when you compare it to the, the things that have a lot of different additives in them and, and you know represent cotton, it's, um, it's, it's a different playing field. So not all bread is, is equal. And, and I think before anybody should cut anything out of their diet, they should think, you know, can I get a better version of this? Would that make my life better? Or do I really need to go to the extreme? As sometimes you do. And yeah. some, sometimes you can do a combination. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an important factor. And then um, I also like to talk about beans and legumes. Um, they're one of my favorite things. They're like the unsung okay. heroes of the kitchen. Yeah. Um, but they had so much fiber, you know, in them, mm -hmm. and they're, they're really good for us. They're one of the areas that a lot of Americans fall short on in terms of diet just because we're not used to eating them. Mm -hmm. So people who like Indian food, who like Latin American food, will kind of start exploring around with the beans and legumes. But otherwise, they really get left alone. People still don't know how to prepare them. Yeah. So, you know, lentils, you don't have to soak. You can just rinse them and, you know, clean them and cook them right away. Mm -hmm. um, red lentils take five minutes to cook. So in the time it takes you to call for kids, carry out, you could have a nice red lentil soup, puree, yeah. you know, dip, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, also the regular lentils the same way, and there are many yeah. different types. Mm -hmm. Lentils were also a currency in ancient times. So in mm -hmm. Italy, in the, on New Year's, we eat lentils for good luck, like black eyed peas in the south here. Yeah. But they say it's because they look like coins, and I'm like, no, it's because they were coins. They were actually <laughs> coins. Um, 
but then all the beans. So beans, yes, you do have to soak them overnight if they're dry. Sure. Um, or if you want to speed that up, you can put boiling water on them and cover them for an hour off yep. the stove. Mm -hmm. it, it speeds it up and then you can cook them. But I recommend people doing it once a week. You know, if you're at home, you're, you're doing things on the computer, you're doing laundry, or someone's mowing the lawn, whatever, this is a great time to like, you know, make some beans and just have them for the week because yeah. they can get thrown into everything. And, and, th and that way you make sure that you get your, your fiber component. Fiber is really important, especially for people with diabetes, because it helps them um, with the, with the um, insulin intake and the, the manage of that, the, re the resistance to the insulin. So it's a, it's a great thing to have. Got it. Um, so we talked a little bit about the history of them. Yeah. And also nuts and seeds. You know, uh -huh. when we think of nuts and seeds, we think of a salty bar food. We think of a snack that people shouldn't have. But nuts and seeds are everywhere in the Mediterranean. They're they're incorporated into the into the recipes. They're used as a garnish. There are vendors on every street corner that has yeah. you know <laughs> roasted chickpeas or roasted nuts or roasted, mm -hmm. and they're they're you know great sources of, of plant based you know omega nutrients mm -hmm. and things like that. So they're also great snacks. They, we're always in the in needing portable snacks in the states. So this is a, a good way to um, eat them and have them to to kind of curb your appetite. Yeah, they've proven that if you eat a handful of almonds and a handful of um, olives before a meal, like 15 minutes before a meal, that you're able to absorb a lot of nutrients better oh. and um, you'll digest the food more slowly. So that's like, you know, a built-in antipasto. That's kind of what everybody's doing anyway. So if you're yep. home, you're hungry, you're preparing food, that's like a great thing to eat Slide it in there as you go. Right. Hey, I have right. a question from an audience member here. Sure. Uh, Callista asks, um, you had mentioned carbs are good to eat. Could you talk about that in terms of the ketogenic diet? Many people seem to believe that carbs can be harmful for people. Sure. Thoughts on that? So it depends on the, the individual, you know, and everybody should talk to their healthcare provider. To If they need to be on a low carb diet, then I, I don't want to contradict what their doctor is telling them to, to go against it. And everybody's actually metabolism is a little bit different. And they're, mm -hmm. you know, looking at DNA now and people who, you know, what kind of what your great grandparents did. And if your great grandparents came from places which were, you know, eating a lot of, of um, fish and kelp and things like that, you're going to need to have a lot more of that in your diet than someone else. Yeah. My ancestors were eating a lot of wheat, and so I'm kind of predisposed to be able to eat it. So it, it depends on, on that. I would say somebody, you know, following or recommended that they follow keto does, if they're going to do any carbs, that they, they do the most complex carbs that they can, mm -hmm. that they, they do, that, that the carb content comes from like beans or something like that okay. as, in, instead of grains. Versus that would be a better, bit, yeah. a better choice for them, sure. Good. That's a great question. Okay, great question. Thank Kalise, you. Kalise uh, means the beautiful one well, in, in, in ancient Greek. So <laughs> <laughs> Santorini, that was the name of the, the island of Santorini, and that's a beautiful name. Yeah, beautiful place. Yes, yes. Great. Okay, so seafood, so protein. See, yes, going going straight again to, to the you know Mediterranean. A lot of people um, don't like seafood in, in the States, I find. Uh, there's, a, there's a big distaste yeah. for it. People think about, oh, Friday I had to eat fish for Lent because I couldn't eat meat. But yeah. this, this idea didn't take place in the Mediterranean. Seafood was always prized. Mm -hmm. um, and during fasting periods, for example, in Greece, people couldn't have seafood. So when they could have it again, it was something everybody wanted to have. It, mm -hmm. You know, not only are you bordered in most countries by the Mediterranean, but some places, the Atlantic, the Aegean, the Ionian, the, the, the um, you know, Arabian Sea. So there are a lot of different bodies of water, lakes and rivers and streams that people are getting different types of fish from in the Mediterranean. <laughs> and they recommend eating two to three <coughs> times a week uh, seafood. And they say that if you add just one single addition of fish to your diet per week, you will reduce your, reduce your risk of heart disease by 49%. So seafood's a great lean source of protein for people to go to, very easy to cook and, you know, lends itself to, you can flavor it any way you like kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but um, the mm -hmm. ones like salmon, tuna, halibut, sole, those are the ones that are, are really rich in the, the omega-3s um, that, that will help people. Um, seafood also has a lot of zinc and potassium and selenium. Right. So there are a lot of nutrients um, in high quantities that are great for the brain, great for fat burning, um, mm -hmm. and, and great for kind of fuel and, and energy as well. Um, great for, for mood disorders and things like that. There have been a lot of studies um, with seafood. So the, the more that you can get, the great. But this, this also has a little bit of a historical component to it too because in when I mentioned those agrarian festivals, they also used to have fe festivals in ancient Egypt each year for the, when the Nile flooded mm -hmm. because the Nile would flood twice a year and the flooding of the Nile provided the irrigation that was needed for all of the crops. So that's what, you know, because crops were currency in antiquity, that's what made Egypt so wealthy. So when the Nile flooded, they would have a Nile festival and they would give thanks to the Nile god. Mm -hmm. There was a Nile god named Hapi, H-A-P-I. Mm -hmm. And they, during those times, they were, they were quote unquote fasting, which meant they couldn't take anything out of the Nile. They could only put prayers and candles and things like that on the Nile. I then see. after the fast came down, they were allowed to eat fish. 
you take that sentiment forward to Italy and the Feast of the Seven Fishes, and you know, for, for a holiday, you're purposely eating many, many different types of seafood. So it's, it gives it the notion of a celebratory food. And yeah. even though it might be a little bit less expensive or, or, or different than meat, it always had a, a high regard in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. fishing, fishing itself was a big industry and, and still is in, in, the, in the Mediterranean region. So when fishermen would come back with a lot of different type of seafood, you know, it's synonymous with wealth, synonymous with abundance, and people are going to eat. Um, and, and so it's, it's seafood is well loved. Yeah, and it's pretty you know readily available. Let's be honest, right? Yeah. I mean, salmon is not pro prohibitively expensive, nor exactly. is tuna. Cod certainly not. Right. Halibut less so. But these are you know the ones that are so nut nutrient rich. Exactly. Um, boy, I'm gonna fold another day of fish into my, into my diet. <laughs> Wonderful. If I can do it. <laughs> Forty-nine percent less likelihood of. That's incredible. Yeah, just one additional serving. Boy. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make that change. That's awesome. <laughs> So we talk about dairy and poultry. Uh -huh. um, a lot of people, you know, talk about no dairy in the Mediterranean diet or they try to limit the dairy. Um, in, in the pyramid, they say two to three times a week, you know, things like that. There are uh, Some people are a little bit skeptical about dairy, and not all dairy is created equal. You know, it's goat, sheep, cow. They're all different. They all have different properties. And a lot of what's going on in the Mediterranean is goat and sheep milk dairy. Yeah. So just, you know, get that off there right from the top. But also, um, if we look back in history in nomadic times, people w couldn't, you know, slaughter an animal every single day and have that meal for that or keep it preserved for tomorrow or whatever. Yeah. That was something you did on holidays. That was something you did to welcome an, a very honored guest, mm -hmm. a sign of hospitality. But day-to-day -day purposes, people were eating yogurt and cheese. Mm -hmm. um, they would they would strain, you know, the milk and to make the yogurt, and they would um, put between hides um, the yogurt and hit it back and forth to make cheese. And that's probably kind of what people were sustaining themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So there is a lot of a lot of dairy eaten, wonderful dairy um, throughout the Mediterranean, no matter what mm -hmm. country you go in, different times, different different types, but um, amazing dairy tradition. So, you know, eggs are getting more and more good media. There was a, there was a time when they were getting horrible media, now they're getting yep. good media, but so, you know, eggs are a mainstay just as long as we don't overdo it. Yogurt's really good. Everybody knows about the probiotics in yogurt. Yeah. But what people don't talk about is uh, something, a substance called inulin. So inulin helps to regulate the blood sugar levels. And that's also found in yogurt. You know, a cup of Greek yogurt has 20 grams of protein in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, a significant portion of the recommended daily allowance of protein. Mm -hmm. um, cottage cheese, goat cheese, aged cheeses, um, also chicken, turkey, you know, Cornish hens. These are all good options um, per the Mediterranean diet. Um, we talked a little bit about, about baking and, and mm -hmm. kind of grains, and I just want you know also to tell people that the art of baking is like so important in the Mediterranean. When mm -hmm. I when I talk about that, I tell people I love to bake. Our, our family originally had bread bakeries in southern Italy, so mm -hmm. it's just something that's always been part of me and something that I love to do. Something I did with my grandmother. Um, people think it's an oxymoron. Well, you're talking about a diet and you're baking, and it, but you know bread and savory baked goods are a really important part. Whether you know you're in Israel or Egypt or France or um, Morocco, a really important part of the culture. Um, it's important to use local things that you're, you're making at home. You can, you can get a cheap you know, mill now and even grind your own wheat berries if you mm -hmm. want to. But just make your own bread. It's much, much better than what you're going to buy. It's an activity. My students always tell me, oh, I'm getting a workout. And I'm like, yes, you are. that's the point. It is a workout. Right. And you can control what you eat. Um, you can control what goes in it. You can use you know, uh, agave nectar or honey instead of other sweeteners. Good one. You can put yeah. different seeds into it. Use different whole grains. And mm -hmm. it can become a wonderful part of a meal. You know, the, the, the baked goods that you eat in these artisanal bakeries overseas, it, you probably experience it yourself. You have a piece of bread, and you're done. You feel like you ate something. You feel like yeah. that's, the, that's almost as good as a main event. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, uh, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of pieces of bread in order to give you that same kind of a, a thing. So by making your own, you can you can really add a pleasurable you know tradition into your lifestyle, but mm -hmm. also control the nutrients a little bit more. Hey, I have another question. Uh, sure. I back up the proteins that okay. I we just covered it a moment ago. Uh, Charles asks, is it possible to define a, a Mediterranean diet? We're kind of in the process of sure. doing so now. I think sure. there's many many parts to it. In other words, how does it differ from a vegetarian diet, which seems to have many of the same benefits? And where does red meat fit into the diet? We didn't mm -hmm. really cover that. Um, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Thought. Hi, Charles. So that's a great point. Thanks for asking the question. Um, so vegetarian is very similarly aligned to um, to the Mediterranean diet because mm -hmm. your all of your meals are supposed to be plant based. So you can still have some some like chicken or the lean dairy that we talked about like two to three times a week. And you think meats are paired with sweets in the Mediterranean diet. So yeah. I have a chapter for them at the end of my book. Something you want to have like once a week. 
on special occasion, you know, if you can once a month, but you yeah. don't want to completely wipe them out because then um, it, you, it will create kind of this, this desire that you can't be satisfied. You want to yeah. kind of satisfy your urge a little bit while, every now and then, but not go overboard. Uh -huh. And when you do have meat, you know, it's usually done very savvily, like around, you know, in a stew or a tagine or something that mm -hmm. usually has a lot of vegetables around it. You mentioned you got your fish and it came with artichokes. So yeah. um, that's, that's something to think about. Yes, it will be the main thing, but you're still going to have a lot of vegetables with it. Right. So I would say for the, for the red meat, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, whatever you can do with that. If you want to be vegetarian, great. Um, you, you don't need to eat meat to be on the, the Mediterranean diet, but you mm -hmm. also don't need to go without. And that's a great question that he asks and a great point that he brings up because there are some of the, the Mediterranean lifestyle experts that are um, promoting veganism and vegetarianism. And part of the reason is that is because when they, a lot of researchers go to the Mediterranean, like they'll go to Greece during the Lenten season and they'll report back that nobody eats meat or dairy or fish. And it's, be, it's because it's during Lent. It's not because they don't want to eat meat or dairy or fish. So mm. uh, you don't have to avoid any of those things. But if you want to, you know, you could still do the, the Mediterranean lifestyle within mm. it. It would be totally fine. Um, I, I think that's, that's wonderful that he brings that up. Good. Thank you, Charles. Great question. Olive oil. So olive oil is one of my favorite topics. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a uh, you know, wonderful ingredient. It's the ingredient that unites all of the Mediterranean together. So no matter where you are, everybody produces olive oil, eats olive oil to a certain extent, some more known than others, but everybody's got it. Mm. And I've learned a lot about olive oil because I go to different conventions and conferences mm. around the world. Mm -hmm. um, to Italy, I've done some with the Italian Trade Agency, for example, where I'll be the guest of part of these big conferences where they have people talking about the health aspects. They have someone from the Vatican talking about their religion aspects. Mm -hmm. They have uh, cooks talking about the recipes. And then they have tastings where they teach you, you know, everything about olive oil. So there's a lot for people to be learned about olive oil. But when I was doing the research for my book, uh, most of the, the Mediterranean diet research that I could find was actually based on olive oil. So I had so much research that couldn't fit into this book because it was disproportionate to everything else. Yeah. And I started another book. So now okay. I'm working on an olive oil book. Oh, but great. Um, Hippocrates actually used to prescribe olive oil to treat different things. And so um, it can be, when it's a good high quality olive oil, and this is key because the next slide is going to get into what is good and what is high quality and what should I buy, which I could spend a year talking about, but we'll yeah. make it short. Um, it, it helps so many things. Basically anything that the Mediterranean diet says it's good for, whether it's cancer or tumors or ADHD or Parkinson's or whatever, also olive oil can help if it's a good quality, high phenolic olive oil. So um, what does that mean? Um, and this is a picture I have here. These are, these, this is Hadrian's uh, temple in Rome where mm. we actually had the olive oil, one of the olive oil conferences, mm. and it talks about um, the, you know, the experts talking there and the panel and things like that. And I have a blog post that I put there for everybody. If you want to have all the notes of this and not, you know, you have to remember what I say, it's called What the Italians Want You to Know About Olive Oil. Mm -hmm. But I talk about more than just Italian olive oil, um, yeah. but that's the title of the blog post. So the first thing is the definition of extra virgin. So mm -hmm. that scares a lot of people. Like, what does extra virgin mean? Mm -hmm. So for an olive oil to be extra virgin, it has to have 0.8% acidity or less. So in the world of olive oil, the lower the acid, the higher the quality. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. The second thing to know about that definition is w no one is controlling that in the United States. So anybody can come in and say, I have extra virgin olive oil, and it's very hard for us to know whether it's real or not. Right. So um, that's where all the corruption comes in and yeah, things like that. That's right. There are you know, different councils in California, the mm. National Olive Oil uh, Association, and different places like that that are, are now developing things, but there's no governmental control. So how do we get around that? Well, you can use labels, uh, the, the overseas labels, the DOP from Italy, the PDO mm -hmm. from Greece, anything from Spain, things that are marked organic. Usually those are more, y you can rely on them, mm -hmm. where you can't just go by the extra virgin, unfortunately, label. Some companies will put the number of virginity on their bottle, the really high quality ones or the, the, the um, single varieties or the smaller kind of producers yeah. will put 0.4% acidity. So if someone's gone to the trouble of labeling the amount of acidity that they have, yeah. then they can usually back that up. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Okay. Um, polyphenols. Polyphenols are the antioxidants in olive oil that make it good for us. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that claim to do all of those things like, you know, help against the tumors and preventing cancer and the ADHD mm -hmm. and weight loss and diabetes. Um, and on the scale we use, they can go up to about 900 in terms of the polyphenol level in an, in an olive oil. Mm. So no, most, you know, commercial brands don't denote polyphenols. And even if you go into the specialty stores, most people don't know. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the, in the um, post, I actually recommend some brands and some people which actually can tell you. Okay. Uh, in our DC area, we have some people where it can tell you, or you can research online what is polyphenols. Mm -hmm. The next thing you need to know about is what are called cultivars. So cultivars are the variety of olives. There are about 880 known varieties or cultivars in the world now. So we know Kalamata, Koroniki, Gaeta, mm -hmm. those kind of things, but there are many. 
And each of them, depending upon their terroir, um, have a natural amount of polyphenol levels already. So you know, like if you're getting a Koroniki from Greece, they're generally a high, they're generally a high phenolic olive oil. So you can do your research, figure out which varieties you like from which countries, and then go for those in terms of polyphenols. Mm. Polyphenols label, date labels are very important because as olive oil ages, it loses its antioxidants, it loses its polyphenols. Mm -hmm. And it, um, so it will still be fresh. Like a lot of chefs will tell you, oh, you can use, po you can use olive oil with a year. And yeah, usually you can if it's not rancid, right. but you're not gonna have the same polyphenols in that year. If I take a bottle, oh, really? yeah, okay. if I take a bottle and close it and put it in the cupboard and then open it a year later and go to use it, if we tested the polyphenols, it will have lost at least a third of its polyphenols. And that's without being exposed to light or, or uh, heat or anything like that. If you leave it out on the counter, it's gonna go even much more quickly. Yeah. So it's still good. You can still eat it, it's still healthy fat, but it's not gonna do you as good in terms of culinary medicine as it does when it's first come out. The optimal mm -hmm. time is within the first three months of pressing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's hard to get commercially. You have to really pay attention to what yeah. you're doing, but you can get it. And right. smaller batches or get a big batch um, that you can share with your family yeah. and, you know, or your friends and go through it quickly and then order more. So you can always have it right. um, in terms of medicinal. You need about two to four tablespoons of um, olive oil per day to start reaping these benefits. Wow. Um, a lot of people are going towards the four okay. um, uh, label. And then, but you know, if you put it on dressing, if you put it, if you put it as use it as a dressing, you put it on top of your yogurt or in a dip or um, in a sauce, it, the four tablespoons go really more quickly than you think. Trust me, hey, can I, I, I need to cut down my olive <laughs> I was just gonna ask, <laughs> yeah. I won't ask if you uh, just have it by the spoon bowl. I do, I do, oh, no, okay. it's okay, I do. All right, um, unfiltered versus filtered, is there mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. there? Um, nutritionally, or is it mostly just a flavor well, experience? Well, they not really because they have a lot of natural filtration uh, processes that they're doing now. Sure. So you don't you don't lose anything with with filtration. But sometimes the ones that are labeled unfiltered are yeah. less processed than the other ones. So yes. in a okay. very indirect way, it might be better. Okay. But if you can if you can get one that comes from like like an estate olive oil that, that has natural filtration, yeah. that's the best of all okay. of all words. Is you yeah. can fry an olive oil. The smoke point of low acidic. Right. High quality olive oil is actually higher than a lot of other oils. Oh. So that's a big misconception that you can't fry an olive oil because the smoke point is low. It's not. It's actually higher. You, it can go up to about 410 degrees. Whereas to fry wow. like croquettes or fish and chips, you only need 385. Yeah. So it's perfectly fine. It's People don't like it because it's a little bit cost prohibitive. You know, it's more expensive than, yep. it, than something else, but it's very good for you and has better flavor. Mm -hmm. um, the new thing that will be happening in, in the world of olive oil in terms of gastronomy is we're going to start pairing olive oils with food. And it also will have an effect on health. This is what they're doing now um, in Italy and in Spain. Chefs know how to pair each dish with a particular olive oil. So, for example, one of my favorites is the carolea from southern Italy. So I will, I will taste you know, an eggplant dish and think, okay, I'm going to pair that with the carolea, and then I'm going to pair it with the galliopo grape. Just like you pair wine, you pair the olive oil. Mm. And it helps people to become more familiar with the different flavors. Some olives have very buttery flavors, so I, you yes. can use them in baking. Um, but it's still olives, so it's, um, that's a fun thing for people to be able to learn. Now, if people are at home and they want to know how they can tell about the polyphenols in their olive oil, when you taste it, you can actually feel a burn down here. So what, just, yeah, you mentioned the yeah, peppery burn. Yes, that's yeah. important. Bitter is important. It's a oh. sign of good quality in olive oil. The bitter flavor, which a lot of Americans don't like, but if right. you can get used to bitter, it's a great, it's most of the very nutrient things have a lot of bitter flavor. Yeah. So good for olive oil. And then also the burn. So when you um, ingest the olive oil, you kind of slurp it back. So you do this kind of uh, through your uh, taste buds. And yeah. as you do that, in about 10 to 30 seconds, you should feel some burn. The burn is of very good quality because um, so far, knock on wood, nobody has started adding pepper to, to replicate that. Some of the ones I taste in, from Sicily, for example, are so potent in terms of, of polyphenols that they actually taste like you're drinking boiling water. Um, they have a great flavor, but the burn is so intense that they have to cut it with other things to make it less intense. Oh. That, but that's what you want. For a health yeah. benefit, I think it would cure you know, most things. Um, so that's very, very important. And people can, can kind of pay attention uh, with that when they're tasting as well. Perfect. We're going to have a link to Amy's blog at the end, by the way, so you can oh, check, great. Out, check out the olive oil articles or any other associated articles on that. Sure. This has been my favorite chapter. Oh, the citrus juice? <laughs> no, I like the, the olive oil. oil I love olive oil, it's too. Been super yeah, fun. yeah, it's okay. great. It's great. Citrus You'll juice. never look at it. That's the bad thing. You're never going to look at it the same way again. No. Um, citrus juice is a great natural spouse to the olive oil. Mm -hmm. And, you know, douse on everything in the Mediterranean. There's always spinach with lemon and orange juice, lemon and olive oil, lemon yep. and lime, no matter where you are. And they're perfect because all of the, you know, antibacterial properties, the anti inflammatory properties, the nutrients that are found in citrus juice become more absorbed when we eat them with, with olive oil. Mm -hmm. So they complement one another mm -hmm. and they go on everything. Um, and they help us to eat less. Also, the, the, the citrus kind of flavor does, does something with us, which it helps us to eat a little bit less. It's a great thing. Lemons are um, 
uh, alkaline. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's interested in like an alkaline acidic balance, I get that request a lot. Some people, um, when your body's in a disease state, it usually has a higher al um, acidic level and people need to eat alkalizing foods in order to kind of balance out. So all the green foods, all the naturally brown foods, away from the meat, away from the, the alcohol and the fried foods and things like that. Um, but lemon juice, even though it tastes acidic, it's alkalizing. So mm. it's a great thing to always have in water just to kind of balance out the body's pH because even though people might have a very healthy diet, in the United States, just the kind of like the environmental stressors and the things that we have, it's, it's good to have, you know, a little alkalizing influence. You, you can't really have too much of an alkalizing thing in modern times, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. So these are some of the illnesses uh, that are improved by the Mediterranean diet. Sure. Um, you know, 47% less likely to develop heart disease, uh -huh. um, reducing the risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, um, increased longevity, reduced inflammation. So I know you saw the, the Facebook Live thing that I did with, with Dr. Pappas on yes, the inflammation. Okay. Inflammation is um, at the baseline of most illnesses. That was and just, so okay. um, if, if people can have an anti-inflammatory kind of lifestyle or an anti-inflammatory diet, then um, they can either improve you know, like chronic pain and things that they have or mm -hmm. you know prevent these type of illnesses. So it's, it's a great thing to follow. And um, that's one of the good things about the Mediterranean diet is that, that it reduces the inflammation as well. Mm -hmm. um, heart disease, cancer, tumor growth, ADHD, Parkinson's, um, hypertension, all of them have shown to be improved. Um, and here I have the actual studies. I won't, I won't bother reading it to people because um, mm -hmm. they can read it on themselves. But yeah. I had actually to do to translate these for two years of what was going on as I was writing uh, this book. And it was really fascinating because so many of the studies ended the same way. Like they would have two control groups, one doing a low fat diet and one doing the Mediterranean diet. And they just, and, and almost all the studies, they would kind of terminate them early and say, well, it's inhumane to let this low fat group continue <laughs> when we see how much better they can do on the Mediterranean diet. Wow. So, um, you know, that's something I wanted to remind people. A lot of, a lot of the experts that, uh, that are watching already know, but for, for the patients, a lot of things people don't realize is that a lot of um, nutrients are fat soluble. So like people are taking turmeric pills because they're, they're um, anti-inflammatory and they have joint pain and that's what they've been told to take, but they're eating a very low fat lifestyle, it, it, low fat diet, and so they're not getting the, the fat with the turmeric that they need to help it to be absorbed in the body. So for any fat soluble nutrients, it's mm -hmm. really important. That's, you know, the olive oil comes in or avocado or wherever you want to get it from, yeah. you know, the healthy fishes kind of thing. Um, and increased longevity. There are so many reports about the increased longevity. And you know, if you go to places like Ikaria which in Greece, which is one of the places I do my culinary tours, people, they say it's an island people forget to die. Mm -hmm. And um, they, you know, the diet has been constantly looked at as has the diet of Crete and the diet of Sardinia and the diet of people that have places that have a lot of centurions. Not yeah. only do they reach the numbers, but they're reaching them with relatively few health problems and they're, they're living better and they're enjoying their lives more. Yeah. And, um, and, and drinking and smoking cigarettes. Exactly. Which Exa is, so you they're, know. You know, they're able to, they're, and that, I'm glad you brought that up because people want to think that it's perfect, yep. um, but it's not. And right. so that because of the, what we're talking about and because of the lifestyle, um, they're able to kind of, you know, ha prevent even harmful things from affecting them, which is really, really cool. Right, right. I have a couple questions here. Sure. Um, we've breezed past the topics, but I think they're, they're, they're important to get to. Sure. Uh, Brenda asks, if a, per if a person is lactose intolerant, can you still have goat and sheep milk and cheeses? Well, it depends. What's the lactose it de it, deal there? It depends how the diagnosis is and how serious it is. Is, is it okay. really lactose intolerant? Like, because there, there is lactose in the other types of, of uh, milks right. also. So it's not that they're totally going to avoid that. But a lot of them are easy to, easier to digest. So okay. it depends upon the severity. And you know, you could either get a clearance from your doctor and then kind of try it out and uh -huh. see how it would be. Um, okay. But for example, goat milk in particular has a lot of proteins in it. It's, it's more easily digestible because it's similar to the more similar to the human physiology. Okay. So um, it's also really great for muscle recovery after workouts and things like that. Yes. Sheep milk have its own properties. They also have their own tastes. Mm -hmm. um, some some uh, doctors that I know will recommend aged aged sheep cheese, like a manchego or a pecorino okay. or something like that for people who are who are lactose sensitive and that helps them. If okay. it's a complete intolerance, um, then maybe no. So it, it, okay. I would I would get that severity measured before I would go at it. But if, if you're just like, a, it's a little bit uncomfortable, then probably you could do the goat's milk and you and the hard sheep's milk cheeses and you'd be fine. Yeah. And the, for example, the yogurt in Greece, we call Greek yogurt the one that they sell here in the United States because it's thicker, we call it Greek, um, but it's made with cow's milk. So in Greece, in order to be called Greek yogurt, it has to be made with a certain percentage of sheep and goat milk. It's mm. the same thing with ricotta cheese in, in southern Italy. It's always made with sheep and goat milk. It's not made with cow. But here, uh -huh. because we have a lot of cow, that's what we use. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah. 
Perfect. Good question. I have another one, a follow-up from Calista. Uh, does heat harm the good properties of the olive oil? Anything nutritionally compromised by heating it up? Sure. Well, it's not as good as it would be if you had it raw. I mean, having raw sure. is always better. It's, it's, um, but it's still, a, it, when you heat it, it's still a better option than the other oils out there. I mean, yep. deep fat, no one's ever going to recommend that you deep fat fry food, but if you yep. have to, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good substitute to go to. And, and you can, you know, you can saute with it and things like that and, and have it be perfectly fine. So that's, yeah. that's not an issue. But if, if you're looking at it specifically for medicinal purposes and you're comparing, you know, should I have four heated up tablespoons a day or four cold, probably the, the, the four cold are going to give you a little bit more bang for your buck. But the, yeah. uh, but the other one is a good second, a good second backup. I like to give people the best case scenario and then what to do at the end of the day. Yep. Um, yeah, don't let that deter you from, from frying up something delicious. Right, yeah. right, okay, especially good. on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, uh, I should note that we do have eight minutes left, by the way, so any questions, now is probably the time to uh, throw them our way. We've got a number sure. of slides. We might not get to them all. Let's so I'm going to skip over the inflammation because we okay. talked about that a little bit before. Okay. Um, in some of my, my talks and in some of the things, for example, that I do with doctors who are going to go back and, and return and you know, bring the information to their patients, um, in terms of making the, the buy-in to a healthier lifestyle or healthier thing, that can be hard, especially if you're working with corporations. Yeah. So it sounds like a no-brainer. It sounds like everybody would want to be happier and healthier, but not always because it, it always seems like it's you're cutting down on your productivity or coming, you're cutting down on your work or you're, mm -hmm. you're taking more personal time. But, it, you know, I, I, I like to remind people that it's actually the opposite because if you have better health, you're going to have better performance yeah. and less, you know, health care costs and things like that. So yeah. these, these are important when you're dealing with the corporate entities. Um, and, you know, productivity can't be compared enough. Um, th this is something that I like to tell people about making a meal plan. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have gotten away from menus and gotten away from me meal plans. And there are a lot of apps and a lot of services that are doing that for people so right. that people don't have to think about it. But, mm -hmm. but that could be a fun kind of a, you know, a, a no-brainer kind of a thing to just do and let yourself think about where, you know, you get inspired, you kind of see, you know some things that you like in restaurants, know some things that you had traveling, and you want to make it at home. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where your inspiration starts. And then you have this list of what people in your family can and should be eating. Yeah. For yourself, and you're working off of that, um, and you kind of think about you know th this all week long. Like what you're mm -hmm. going to eat is an all week long thing because maybe Monday you're getting inspiration, and Tuesday you're making a list, and Wednesday you're thinking about where you're going to buy it from. Thursday you actually go out and get the groceries. Friday you take things home and prep things. So or, or th you know Thursday or Friday whatever. But I, I recommend that people prep food when they get it or like the next day mm -hmm. one time. Not that they're prepping every time they're cooking. They do it restaurant style. It makes it much easier. Okay. If you've got everything cut up, you can buy things cut up nowadays. You have things in your refrigerator stored, you know, all the vegetables already cut up stored, mm -hmm. um, your beans that you, you cook once a week stored, a, you know, millet or quinoa or, or amaranth or barley cooked in, in a little container in there. Um, mm -hmm. It's much easier because when you come home from work, you want to make a stir fry, you want to make a stew, right. you just go in and grab almost like your own little salad bar in yeah. the kitchen yeah. you want to make a bowl and it's it's all there you don't have to it, you can do it in five minutes and you get good quality nutrition I, mean, I would love for people to want to be in the kitchen for 12 hours a day but i realize that, <laughs> that not everybody has that that desire yeah. so that's the thing um and then I, I have what i call an honest meal plan mm -hmm. because what i find is people decide they want to eat healthfully and mm -hmm. they go to the store they go to the farmer's market or they grow their own things and they get the best possible things available and they look at it and they don't know what to do with it right. or um, they don't want it. Then they want to run to whatever, you know, they used to do before their call for takeout or whatever because it's, it's too much work. So you have, you have to make what's, what is called an honest meal plan, whereas you take into account your days that you know are going to be 12 or 18 hour days that the last thing you want to think about is food. And yeah. you take into account when you have a little bit of free time. You take into account if you have any helpers who want to get in the kitchen and, and help you out. Yeah. You take into account, okay, in reality, this is the food, but I know I like to eat Thai. I know I like to eat this uh, Indian. I know I like to eat Latin American food. So, yes, I bought everything this way, but how can I transform that into these types of food that I like to eat so that I'm going to want to be eating at home more? Yeah, right. Very That's good advice. Thank you. <laughs> These are some serving sizes, so I like to give these out to people um, when I'm doing lectures and things because a lot of people, you know, don't know at the end of the day. They don't want to have spoons out to kind of break up the, the, the process of, of cooking, but they have to know. So, you know, uh -huh. a handful of nuts, uh, uh, usually a palm is like a serving of a protein. If you go to a restaurant, you know, it's the size of my book is usually a serving of a protein, but it's really <laughs> yeah. the palm of your hand. <laughs> and so this, you know, a cup is a fist, and, and that gives people a good, oh, that's how much salad I should have, or that, that's... Yeah. Um, Portion size is really important. In, in yeah. Europe and in uh, the Mediterranean, people usually have smaller portions. They don't entertain that way. They will yeah. offer you everything, but right. the, the actual portions that they're eating are usually smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and then I give people tips to save money. Uh, money is 
kind of one of the, the latest layers in what I do. I never used to talk about budgets and things like that. When I started, a lot of times I was doing things um, with, you know, very high profile clients or, you know, um, royalty or, you know, things that didn't really have a, a, a um, price tag on or I didn't have to worry about a budget. But then as I started talking about health more, that was one of my number one you know, kickbacks is even if people like to cook and even if people um, are willing to spend a little bit of time talking about nutrition, they're talking about money. Well, it's much cheaper to get things. So I started pricing out what I was doing when I was recipe testing mm -hmm. or when I would go to do something on television and I'd find, you know, a really good organic entree to be able to do for $4. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I said, you know, four dollars you can't get a whole lot anywhere for $4, but to have a really good organic entree that's Culinary medicine tastes good, you know, yeah. that's that's something. So some of my tips are, you know, to buy produce that's on sale, which is usually also seasonal. Um, buy in bulk. A lot of the, the organic markets and specialty markets have really good bulk sections, which are much cheaper. Yeah, for sure. Um, the house brands of the organic markets, mm -hmm. you know, cooking from scratch and bringing extra so that it will stretch. Mm -hmm. um, all these kind of things on, on, on saving money, which I, I think anybody who's in the health community now really has to address mm -hmm. um, and be able to provide solutions to people. Just just the idea that, yes, it can be healthy and delicious. We're, we've got that now. Now, and also it can be healthy, delicious, and inexpensive. That's kind of the next final frontier. Yeah, I would think that somebody, you know, the more scarce or esoteric or odd the ingredient is, somebody, right. people, people, the wheels start turning and they think, oh my gosh, this diet's going to be expensive. Right, right. And we had mentioned right? it earlier. You know, what? you said, what about if people couldn't get certain certain ingredients yeah. or things? How would they work that in? And that's not a problem at all because it's always better, you know, you don't have to, to have the Mediterranean diet, you don't have to have everything flown in for the Mediterranean. If you live in a, yeah. a great little town somewhere that has farmer's market or, you uh -huh. know, the farmers are making their own cheese, use that. You know, mm -hmm. that's what's going to be good for you. It's, it's a similar lifestyle, but it's on a different terrain. Yeah, exactly. So there's no uh, impositions or roadblocks there as far as availability of, of food. Exactly. We can all do it. Right. Definitely. Good. Okay, Definitely. good. Uh, we are coming up at the end of the hour. Okay. Uh, Wonderful. Anything that we didn't hit that you think might be important? Anything you want to impart to this particular audience? Um, sure. Because th there's so much here. And again, we'll share the link to Amy's book at the end. Uh, we've got a number of resources and things along those lines that um, are made available to the audience. So I think you'll appreciate that. Um, I certainly enjoyed kicking around all the different resources that you have available. Um, any last thoughts? What are you into these days? Sure. What's the um, next step? Well, it's, it's really a lot of culinary medicine. So I'm doing uh -huh. a Wellness Wednesday Facebook Live series. Okay. Um, we'll start up again on June 6th. Um, every every Wednesday at 12:30, I'm doing uh -huh. it in conjunction with Dr. Sam Pappas in uh, Northern Virginia. On May 31st, I have a public forum called uh, the Mediterranean Lifestyle and its impact on trade and wellness. Mm -hmm. Because in addition to uh, wellness, I think it's important that we expand the the conversation so that we start talking about dollars and make people really take it seriously to look at kind of standard, standardizing and getting everybody on the same boat with the Mediterranean diet or the Mediterranean lifestyle so that we can impact change. Because right now there's a lot of you know people, personalities who want to do things their way and I think it hurts us. I think we should all work together and embrace um, all the great things that the diet has to offer. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, tell us about this last slide. So my throne, uh, Ariston, uh, moderation is best. And I think that's the, that's the perfect way of summing up the Mediterranean it diet. It always comes down to that, doesn't Definitely. it? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, Amy, it's been a pleasure. The pleasure is mine, Chris. It's been a Thank blast. You. Uh, thanks, everybody. Good questions. Nice, uh, spirited engagement there. So I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go to a next step screen. There's some resources that we're going to be sharing. Uh, again, there you can link to uh, Amy's, or at least I suggest check out Amy on Facebook uh, for the Wellness Wednesday series uh, with Dr. Pappas that's coming up. Uh, naturally, Amy's got some videos on YouTube, Twitter, and so on. It's all there. Um, so enjoy those resources. You can download the slide deck just below me there. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Looking forward to seeing you at the next uh, Expanding Nutrition Frontiers webcast. We'll check you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Chris. Bye, everybody.